Welcome to the Masters of Engineering podcast. Uh, we take a look at cool products, the people who develop them, and how they do it. I'm your host, John Hirschtick. I've spent my entire life building CAD software, but the best part of my job is the product developers that I get to meet. And so today in this episode, we have a really cool uh, company as a guest with two guests from the company. It's called Pull to Refresh and very interesting name. We're gonna hear about that in a minute. And with me today is Aaron Crumley, who is the co-founder and CEO of Pull to Refresh and Laurel Tincher, who is the co-founder and chief business development officer for Pull to Refresh. Aaron and Laurel, welcome to the podcast. Hello there. Thanks for having us. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, uh, and I'm really excited to have you because I've never talked to anyone who does anything like what you're doing. So right out of the gates, we just, one of you, please, or both of you, tell us what is it you're doing at Pull to Refresh? Well, at Pull to Refresh, we are working on sinking seaweed into the deep sea for carbon removal. So seaweed soaks up CO2 from the atmosphere and that turns into carbon um, embodied in that seaweed. And so then we sink that carbon into the deep sea where it stays for hundreds or thousands of years. So this can then um, stop global climate change and even potentially reverse it if we um, scale this up. So we're building solar powered unmanned vessels that go out into the ocean and they um, gather up invasive seaweed that's out there. This invasive seaweeds all across the Caribbean, and then we sink that seaweed. So we're we're hoping to uh, eradicate this invasive species issue at the same time. Okay, this is extremely cool and interesting because, you know, because climate change is such a timely topic, and I never heard of anything like this. How did you, how did you come to think about doing this? Well, we got started, um, coming up close to almost two years ago uh, soon. Um, and we started with a, a kind of a think tank process uh, that we were doing online, bringing in experts, interviewing people, um, just comparing different academic papers uh, to each other to see really, we were just on a hunt for solutions. You know, um, if, if we have, if the problem is emissions, then how do we reverse the emissions? So we, that's where we were starting. We weren't, we weren't starting from like the obvious, like don't put the emissions there because that's obviously also important. But the thing is, is that we already did. So we're, we're nearing almost 1.5 degrees warming already just from the emissions that we already did. And these emissions aren't going to go away on their own. They're going to stay in our atmosphere, continuing to um, have these hot temperatures that are not great for our, our climate. Um, so searching high and low, uh, things started to point towards the ocean um, and then things ultimately started to point towards uh, seaweed. But if you come neutral to the to the topic, just completely neutral, like, hey, any solution that's the best solution, that's the one we want, um, then you will arrive at certain fundamentals like the shortage of, of energy to apply to this problem. You know, if you reverse emissions with energy that cause emissions, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you that have a problem. That would be a good idea. So you and don't then, use you don't use a big diesel engine that is going. Yeah, and and wouldn't it be great if you could run a big diesel engine that uses up you know some fuel but uh, removes ten times more emissions? Yeah, it yeah. would be great, but that's defying certain laws of physics. So yeah. fundamentally, combustion has to 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 get those molecules uh, ripped apart. You have to somehow use an amount of energy chemically, physically, uh, elect electrically, you, you have to somehow impose energy on, on the problem. And so to do so with um, the age old photosynthesis that our planet has incredibly evolved to even be able to do to begin with is, is mind blowing. Why don't we use that technology? But then if you try to use photosynthesis on land, you run the numbers, you quickly find out that doesn't get us to where we need to go. There's, you know, you, you need several more planets worth of land uh, to actually reverse <laughs> enough so emissions. Several more planets. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of startling statistics or all of the biomass on earth times 3.5. That's another one that, that gets talked about. Like you, you, you just can't hold on yeah. to that carbon. You, we need to, you remove, have to remove like it. between a trillion. 
we need to remove like a trillion to two trillion tons of CO2. It's just a kind of unfathomable yeah. amount. But yeah, think about every single living thing on the entire planet and multiply it by three. That's how much carbon. Okay. To I have to ask somewhere. you, how big an impact do you think you can make on global carbon? Let's just say that things go as well as you could imagine right now with pull, pull to refresh. What do you think, you know, like if the problem, you know, percent of the total problem or something, how, how big an impact? With an area visible from space, um, but that's not larger than any of our continents, um, you could um, actually solve uh, the climate crisis. This is, this is like mind boggling because I have never heard of a single technology, despite he hearing again, we have, we probably have hundreds of customer companies in my business that are designing products to help with with green you know help with climate change but i've never run into one technology that says this one technology could get our carbon level back where it should be you're saying this that, that your technology could be deployed at a manageable size in the ocean and would take care of the entire world's carbon needs Carbon reduction. Yeah, it's it's it, it is possible. You know that it's not entirely developed. You know, there's a lot of work to do, and there are challenges. There's design challenges all along the way. The ocean being the biggest one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you've you, you've got to get this to operate on the ocean. But fundamentally, just looking at um, how much space you need for photosynthesis, um, how productive uh, certain seaweed species can be in terms of their biomass, like how efficiently they're turning the energy of sunlight into uh, basically pulling off that oxygen and getting the carbon. And then what we know about ocean chemistry, knowing that we're not trying to grow this to hold it. This would be the confusing thing for people. They'd assume this is a big forest in the same way a forest simply holds temporarily while the forest is alive, that carbon. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about really? then sinking yeah. the seaweed to the yeah. depths of the ocean. And, you know, if you have um, this special salad dressing, a uh, thousand Island, uh, yeah. when, when it sits in your refrigerator, it goes in these separate layers. And this is kind of yeah. what happens in the ocean. Yeah. The ocean has these distinct layers as well. And one of the transition points is about a thousand meters down. And around that point, temperatures and salinity and carbon content, everything you can see when you look search for like the uh, ocean water column of carbon, um, you can see a, a dramatic change at 1,000 meters. And so when things die, and this happens all the time in the ocean and has for billions of years, they go to the bottom of the ocean and then they decompose just like leaves decompose and they become dust in the wind and the CO2 actually gets back into the air. So that happens in the ocean too. Everything that dies falls down there and the CO2 becomes dissolved and goes everywhere, including up. But as it goes sideways and up and everywhere diffuses out, it's kind of like social distancing. Every single molecule is trying to get as far away from all the others as possible, um, it gets to a layer that it cannot go above. And, and that's yeah. why there is a one-way valve that the planet has had this entire time. So if there's a, a volcano or an mm -hmm. asteroid or some kind of a peak yeah. CO2 period in history, how have we ever dealt with that? I mean, you know, humans weren't around, but like there have been many moments of dramatically different climates. And what happens is that the ocean gradually absorbs it uh, through the normal life ebb and flow of the ocean. And this will happen. NASA says, uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of years, all of the emissions that humans put into the uh, atmosphere will come back out uh, down, you know, into the ocean. It's just that that's a little too slow for us. Yeah. And, the, and the only it's reason nice that it's difficult and it's a big design challenge to speed it up is because you're lacking in nutrients in the big open ocean. You have nutrients in the coastal environment because the waves are hitting the shore and kicking everything up, and that's where seaweed grows. Uh, some seaweed grows, the invasive stuff grows, you know, spread out in the ocean, but that's still kind of an exception for where there happens to be specific nutrients to do what we're talking about, to really scale and tackle, you know, restoring the climate, really restore the climate to pre-industrial levels as, as if everything, you know, hadn't happened. That is possible, but what you need to do is you need to work with the nutrients that are down at depths below 300 meters. And, and most people wouldn't realize this, that because of the same diffusion thing, social distancing on a molecular level, everything wants to spread out everywhere. 
and it and the nutrients in the ocean that are naturally there do that as well, including up, including down, including sideways. And in the entire top part of the ocean where you have sunlight up to 300 meters down, all of those nutrients okay. get eaten because the sunlight takes those nutrients and now it's all like right. a desert. So all you have to do with your intervention is get the nutrients up to that environment in some kind of contained way and have your species and process it. And you can turn it into products or you can sink it. And that's where you get your solution. Okay. Now, this is an amazing enough story, but I want to get into another cool part of it, which is the two of you, as I understand, neither one of you had any real extensive background in science or engineering. Is that correct? Can you tell us what your careers were? Like, what was your day jobs before you were, you know, before this four pole refresh? Um, well, I was in grad school studying sustainability when we started this project. So I was definitely oh, on okay. a trajectory of okay. looking for a solution. Um, yeah, definitely was like trying to be involved in this space, looking for solutions. I learned about carbon removal during my climate science class. And that day that I learned about it, I was just, this is what I want to work on a hundred percent. And so I did start looking into companies that were doing this and, um, you know, opportunities to get involved and then. Um, Elon Musk announced the X prize for carbon removal and I got kind of interested in that. And so then when Aaron kind of put it out there to start this team, I was, you know, really excited about that opportunity. But prior to grad school, I won um, more like on the marketing and media side of some marine infrastructure projects. So companies built like floating cities and floating solar. So kind of in the marine ocean space, but um, definitely not an engineer and then before that i um started a few other companies in different industries so more of a more of just an entrepreneur we all got entrepreneur right not an engineer but you were you were in the climate science sorry about that is that right that you both have a background in film mm -hmm. I get that? yeah yeah my undergraduate in film. film. your undergraduate in that's what it was we, yeah, we, we kind of i think connected a little bit over that i mean we, we were yeah. all online though primarily networking to find other people that wanted to find a climate solution that and, ah. and I think in the carbon removal space, these are people who aren't just thinking I could change my light bulb or I could um, have my my vehicle be electric. These are people who are thinking, let's go bigger than that. Let, let, let's not have it be a drop in the bucket. So there's a whole community of people out there. And that's that's kind of what we've been tapping into to find ideas and, and to find inspiration and and also to look for expertise. Yeah. By the way, how many how many people are there involved now? Excuse me, I, I didn't mean. Well, I guess I didn't mean. Yeah, yeah I mean, we, we we have a lot of people uh, who have contributed in some way at different points. So, okay. like over sixty people have joined our our team because we're also an X Prize team. So, where are you now? Where are you? So, you've got a clear vision. It's great. Where where are you in the? And you've built you've built a, a you, you, this first vehicle. But where where are you in the journey? Geographically or in the oh. timeline. Uh, well, more importantly in the timeline, but also geographically. Yeah. So, so where we are is we think of it as a minimum viable product. And, and this is the approach you would take if you were like a Silicon Valley startup making an app, you would basically want to know, uh, all of the problems once you're really fully live, you would want to stop imagining what the problems would be and yep. start getting the real problems. Yep. And, Agreed. um, you know, in order to do that, we do have more component tests to do. And so this is the thing we're always trying to balance, like too many component tests and we're just going to be years and we won't have anything to show for, but too much of a full system, minimum viable product, and it might not work. And we won't know why we won't know which of the many systems yeah. within the full so, system. So you're, you're prototyping. When, when do you think you would actually be doing this at scale at a scale to make an impact? How many, how much time needs to pass for that? Yeah. So. We have all of the essential materials to make our next vessel, which is designed to be not a prototype, but a minimum viable product. Uh, we gave ourselves the requirement that it must be able to function a um, emission reversal business. So you, we must, at the end of this build, have something that continuously uh, reverses emissions to some amount that we can sell because we want to see what the problems are there. Does nobody buy it? Is it a certificate problem? Like. You know, uh, we, we want to prove out all of the problems, not just the technology and getting it to work. We know that we can navigate because we got that working before. What we don't know is exactly how well our design will work, where we gather the seaweed into um, a rigid net that we then lower on a winch. The winch is going to lower because it's just commercial stuff. Um, but 
And we know that when it's lower deep enough, because there's peer reviewed papers that it will damage the seaweed and the seaweed will no longer be buoyant. And we've tested that ourselves, like damaging. the. Oh, so that, that's one of the things I was going to ask about. Yeah. Is how do you sink it? So, okay. So, you, so you're, you're proving out the system. And so when could you have that first um, emission reversal? We're trying to move as fast as we can. Yeah. Uh, and, I won't hold you, know. you to it. I'm just wondering. I think our listeners would wonder, you know, is that. Yeah, this year, you know, for sure, this year, this 2023. Year. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, this if we don't. Year. We okay. have to do that. This I mean, is, well, look, 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 things, uh, yeah, that, we're, like, we, we, we have a warehouse space the, in a marine near a marina in actually Panama, speaking of geography, uh, where we can um, either ship to locations to deploy yeah. or. I'm in a marina right now where we, there's a ramp. We could just put this thing in if we had it ready. In our warehouse, we have the um, metal uh, working equipment. Okay. We bought all the tools and we have uh, you know, all of our solar panels so, and all of our batteries. Okay. We're recording this podcast in January 2023 because someone could be listening to us you know, five years from now. And you're saying you think within a year you could launch one of these and it would be, it would be sinking seaweed with carbon. That is really cool. Well, not only that, the more important thing is that measuring what it does, that's super important because if you're just out there, la, 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 we're sinking it, look, it sank, but you don't know how much, then there's no business. And it's really important that we know, wait, how is this going to be paid for and accounted? And, and so that, that's, that's really a key part is that you need to know, and, and it's possible to know because of buoyancy, you know, that the, the seaweed has a certain amount of buoyancy it wants to float and through a digital scale, uh, we will know not only that we did sink the seaweed, but how what the carbon content of the seaweed that we so so your vehicle sink. just to bring our audience onto like I like to say what planet we're on here. So how big when you have your 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 visionary you know for your 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 full production, not necessarily the first one. How big a vehicle system are we talking about? What's the size of one of these? Maybe not the first one, but the ultimate version. Well, well, we have different ideas about the ultimate. Okay. Well, Laura, why don't All you right. share what you think about the ultimate Give me some uh, idea. size? Or even, even a range. What kind of size are we talking about? What does this look like? I know there's pictures on the site. Well, this first vessel is in the, like, they're going to be in the 20 to 30 foot range, like a normal size sort of boat. Um, and so that'll be our first sort of fleet of vessels that's going around in the Caribbean area. Um, after that, we'll learn a lot more and see, how, you know, might need to change the size on that but just in terms of like the cost to build the vessel and all of that it makes sense to keep sort of size um okay. but so then ultimately we have several different ideas for what it might scale up to be you know it could be more of like a, a mega structure it could be a huge fleet of small boats it could be somehow large barges are involved in this like there's really okay. there's a lot of paths um so when the you get size out, would be really sort of scaling like this the, up in the middle the of size Size of a boat, like a small boat, 20, 20 foot up to, it could be hundreds of feet, but we're not talking like mile, like you said, floating city no. size necessarily. Well, I mean, look, you, our imaginations, many people's imaginations could go there. <laughs> and yeah. it's not a bad place to go, actually, because why not? I mean, a thousand years from now, probably there are sections of the planet that are on the ocean and float, yeah. probably. Uh, but generally, it's scalable. It's almost like thinking about solar energy, solar electricity systems. You can have small ones. You can have bigger ones. You know, they they, and so you could build it at a wide range of sizes. But there's no requirement that you need a floating city to get this to work. Exactly, and we we gave ourselves that constraint. And then another question: So you say you collect the seaweed, and then how do you sink it? I can kind of imagine collecting it as an engineering problem. It must be hard, but I can imagine it. But how do you sink it? What's the way you get it? Um, so the seaweed we're working with in the Caribbean is um, is sargassum. So it's a floating seaweed. It's not attached to anything or rooted to anything. And it floats because it has all these tiny little air bubbles. They're, they call it like the um, grapes of the sea. It has these kind of small graping things. And so that keeps it buoyant. Um, but if you lower the seaweed down to a certain depth, then the pressure of the um, the water there will actually pop all of those bubbles. So then the seaweed is no longer buoyant and it sinks. So it's fairly simple, just mechanically lowering it down. And that has been shown. Um, there was an MIT paper that some of ours published sort of proving, okay, if you lower the seaweed or pump it down, however you get it down to that depth, um, it does pop those bubbles. And so how sink, do you, so. 
how do you get it down basic. to that depth? What well, you said, if you mechanically, how do you do that? From you say so you have a floating boat or barge size, I'll call it vehicle for lack of a better term, platform. How do you you, you let's say you've collected a bunch of seaweed? How do you get force it down? Well, get okay, so our, our answer is not going to sound like the best answer because definitely people are going to think of other ways of doing it. All no, no, I want to hear you. That's what I want to hear yeah. your way. No, the reason I frame it that way is just because I think that. There are a bunch of good ways, and we should try them all. Our way of doing it right now is to try to do it with the least amount of capital investment required, and also with the idea that our growth can be um, uh, very small stair steps, not big stair steps where we need our next several billion, but it's like but thousand by thousand, we can grow uh, our, our system. So with that constraint, we decided that a solar-powered vessel sized the way Laurel described with um, about half the size of that vessel, uh, an underwater container that just, it goes along and it's sort of like if you um, had buckets under your arms and you were walking in a pool, you'd get yeah. stuff in the bucket. How do you sink it? I get, like you collected it, so you have a bunch of seaweed. How does it go down? How do you get it to go down? You just lower it like a winch, just like they do a lot you of look. science tests, a lot of fishing, a lot of, a lot of equipment. Oh, so you have a heavy, you have a, something that's got weight to it. Yeah, this is heavier than the buoyancy of the seaweed okay. that it sinks. So you've got a heavy bucket essentially, and then you collect the seaweed into it, and then you you let it gravity pulls it down, mm -hmm. and then you are able to recover. Yeah. You have a winch to bring back the empty bucket. Okay. Right, and and the winch sorry, has a brake, so we can break it. <laughs> we engage the brake when it's pulled back yeah. up, and then yeah. we're just connected. So yeah, there's very few moving parts. We have a total of four actuators in our entire system. That's a left motor, right motor, the brake system that lets it fall by gravity, and then the motor system that pulls it back up. Okay, okay, this is this is this is great, and I love that you go with sim simple designs are are great, you know. And so 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 um, uh, and Laurel, do I have it right that you personally built and tested? Was it? Was it th this prototype you were talking about earlier? Is that correct? Um, Aaron and I did together. Pretty two, much, oh, we had some did. other okay. team members come and help us. As they were. Yeah, the two of us built built it for the most part. And the two of you built it, and even though you had you had studied sustainability, Laurel, but that's not the same as building things. <laughs> and Aaron, you 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 made films, but you know how did the two of you? how did you successfully build something like this if you'd never built anything like it before? Uh, we just went to the hardware store. <laughs> I mean, really. I mean, my dad's a contractor. Like, okay. Yeah. Like, he's like a master woodworker craftsman. So I kind of grew up around that space and, uh, you know, going to Burning Man, working on films, you do end up building a lot of things. Um, okay. Sets for films and, you know, so I definitely, at least basic knowledge of how to put stuff together. <laughs> It's and and a, a vast, a vast, extensive team uh, sure. with specialty sure. skills. Okay. And where are the two of you located on Earth? Um, I'm in California, in like Valley, which is where I grew up. Um, but I did spend about three months in Panama last year. And um, I think Aaron's back in Panama now. I just flew hmm. back yesterday. Yeah. So you're in Panama. Aaron's in Panama. And Laurel, you're in California. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 this has been different at different times. I mean, we did all of what we're talking about in Lucerne, California, um, at, uh, on a lake called Clear Lake, uh, largest lake in California. Um, and some of its conditions, actually, everyone's like, well, that was easy. It's just a lake. Sometimes its conditions are actually worse than here in the Caribbean um, because, you know, it's a huge lake. So it did have waves. We have footage of how the vessel survived uh, the waves. Um, and now, you know, we ultimately need to work with seaweed. So that's why we needed to graduate from the lake. Plus we will hit bigger waves than we could ever find on that lake. So we want to, um, you know, harden our system. So it's ready for that. And eventually we want to have systems that can work in the Pacific ocean. And that'll even be, uh, you know, more demanding. Hey, quick, another quick thing I want to touch on is the name pull to refresh, which I totally didn't get. And then I did get it eventually. And, and I was happy I got right. Can you explain it though to others? Where does that name come from? Um, so we all, all met on the, the Clubhouse app, which is like a social audio. So you can just start a conversation about anything you want to, and people can jump in and chat about that. So 
Aaron um, started a room in there, like who wants to form an XPRIZE carbon removal team? And so we all were jumping in there and talking. And one of the kind of features of, of Clubhouse is that you can change your little profile picture. And so if you want to show people in the room, like something, you change your picture and then you tell people like refresh your screen, like pull to refresh, and then it refreshes and everyone can see that. So it's like something that people say a lot on Clubhouse. Um, and we um, realized like we can pull to refresh literally like on our screen, which we're doing all the time, but then we're also pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere to refresh the earth essentially. So it had this kind of fun double meaning that related to our it origin so story cool. and also to what we're so it's like you pull down on your phone, you pull down to refresh a web page or a clubhouse page. And then what you're doing is taking um, uh, carbon carbon and seaweed and pulling it down. It refreshes the earth. That's the idea, right? Okay. That, that is just super cool and clever. It's a very clever name. Um, uh, you're offering monthly subscriptions of emission reversal. Um uh, you know, I, I actually, when I first knew you were coming on the podcast, I just wanted to try it. So I did get my own. Well, I, I didn't do a subscription. I just did a one-time purchase. But oh, do you think individuals, people like our listeners, me, can we make impact by just doing that on your website? Absolutely. Um, it's live right now, poultryfresh.earth. Um, you know, if you run the numbers, uh, we can actually, not only do we have the technology, um, but we have the will um, and the economy that can solve the climate crisis. The way that we know we have the will is because there have been studies that show that 23% of Americans would spend 20 to $40 a month on the climate if they thought it would really make a difference. And, and if you extend that out to the globe, um, you know, with, in, with countries that are, you know, obviously have the money to be able to do that, um, you actually do have enough money within the, the next few decades uh, to be able to scale up a big system like this. So um, that's why we decided to, you know, go in reverse and, and, and ask the question, well, what would we need to do today to mimic that kind of future? And that's why we made a, a climate dedication page. People can go on and they just pay $20 a month and they get to write the reason why they're doing this for the climate, if a person or a place or whatever their, their thinking is. And then they get uh, to see some custom artwork just for them that, that, that we've generated. Um, and people can, you know, look at it all and see what everybody's writing. And, and, get if I, and if I heard you right earlier, it's possible that the carbon would actually be removed within the year. Well, uh, we are giving ourselves five years to okay. deliver five everything years. that is happening uh, because okay. we don't know what uh, rate we're going to be at. OK, you know, but, we, but still we, something like a year to one to five years. This isn't like, yeah. I don't know, theoretical. You know, it's, there's risk, of course. Any startup has risk. But. It, it could happen relatively quickly, which I think is cool. And this is also why we, we are trying out um, this model of monthly. And we just changed it since you did the one-time thing. And the reason we're interested in monthly is because, I mean, we really think there should be uh, about at least a thousand uh, climate solutions being developed. And I don't think that competitions or government grants um, or uh, VCs that want to get a lot of return are the only way to find, fund them. I think the general public is sometimes a good way to, to fund these things. And so that's why we made that mechanism. Now, speaking of funding, I also understand you're looking for investment. Uh, tell me about how much and what kind of returns there would be for an investor. Would it just be climate removal or are you gonna have a financial return? The uh, carbon renewal, not climate removal, I'm sorry. We're not, um, yeah. we're not openly soliciting investors because that's okay. a whole thing, but sorry. we are talking to um, individuals um, about being an angel investors and the conversations um, are about, yes, what's in it for them and, and, and also how much could this help? Because each vessel is only costing about $15,000 um, of, of raw material slash building expense slash operation expense um, in the range of, you know, 10 to 100 vessels. It could get less, much less if we go more than that. This means that for not much money, we can get a fleet of 20 vessels out there. And so that's that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to raise... Uh, the money from individuals uh, who are, you know, uh, high net worth. Um, this isn't a big deal to them. Um, and if the worst that could happen is we find out that no sinking seaweed in this exact way doesn't work. Uh, but that would 
propel the entire industry forward. Yeah, yeah. You can't go wrong. So the, what, the, the angel investor would then get a psychic return or would there be a financial return because you sold carbon credits to businesses or something? I'm making that up. The, the, the contract says they, they could make money, but the, the question might be, is it plausible that this could ever possibly make money? Maybe that's the question. Yeah, and is I, it? I, I, I think mean. that it, it has yeah. to be. I don't think that we okay. do something so unless it is possible. You're a business. You're not, this is the other thing that was interesting to me. And I'm glad we touched on it. You're not, it's not a philanthropy where you're saying, hey, we're looking for donations. You're looking for investors who would expect a financial return because the revenue would come from people who would pay, like a business would say, I'd buy carbon offsets or people. Right. Is that the idea? Okay. And, and, and not idea. only that, but I think that we're at the dawn of basically an ocean economy where 50% of our fertilizer, fuel, feedstocks uh, will be coming from the ocean. And, and that the, the fundamental capability you need um, to be able to do that is to have autonomous navigation and the managing of seaweed and, and nutrients. If you have that, a whole bunch of things get opened up and unlocked. And I think that actually just reversing emissions is kind of the gateway to a not only um, balanced climate, but balanced ecosystem because we've overused our land with uh, half the land on earth is used for cultivating food. We don't have to be doing that. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that could eventually lead to productization of the material made from the seaweed as well as the fuel and the fertilizer. And you can okay, even grow so the there's lots of, lots of opportunity. I, I have to say, such a cool project pull to refresh you're taking seaweed full of carbon sinking it down and have the potential i've never talked about us i've never met anyone who has one technology that could solve the entire carbon problem congratulations it's really amazing um i you know time flew by i just want to to tell you both um aaron and laurel a huge thank you for joining us today taking time um, to join us on the podcast on Masters of Engineering. I hope our audience enjoyed it. I say thank you to our audience for tuning in or watching if you're on YouTube. Um, uh, how do people learn more? It's pull to refresh.earth, right? Is the is the website. Pull to refresh.earth. I got that right, right? How else can any other way they can contact you or social media? So on social media, our handle is Refreshing Earth. So at Refreshing Earth, you can find us on any social media channel. And then people can also just email us directly through the website at hello at poultryfresh.team, actually. That would be great. You can listen to more of Masters of Engineering uh, at Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts or on video. You can get the video version on YouTube. Um, and I love hearing what you think. So make sure you leave a review. We, we really love it. If you leave reviews of the episode, tell us what you thought of Aaron and Laurel and pull the refresh. And you can follow me on Twitter at J Hirschtick, J H I R S C H T I C K. Aaron and Laurel, thanks again. Incredible thing you're doing. We all are rooting for you to succeed because we'll all be, we'll all benefit from it when you do. Um, and that's it for today. And I want to say, see all everyone next time on Masters of Engineering. Thanks for having us.